Okay, I've just emailed that to you, Simon. Right, that should pop so up we'll... in my inbox in a second. So by all means, start okay. talking and uh, about the club and so on, and I'll bring up the slides as soon as I've got them. No worries. Well, I'll just introduce myself. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me to talk this evening. It's really appreciated. And um, uh, yeah, just to confirm, I'm the communications manager at Hastel Golf Club. Um, we're basically a, 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 a private club, but we play on a public course. So we don't actually own the course or the clubhouse or have any income from green fees or, or anything along those lines. Uh, secondly, just to um, say, you'll probably notice I've got a missing tooth. Um, forgive me that. I've got a bit of a hillbilly look about me tonight, and that will be uh, the same for a little while longer yet until it gets until it gets resolved. Um, a bit of background on on the sort of history at Haste Hill is, is basically we, we believed that we were coming up towards the club centenary. Um, we thought it was actually in 2026. That's what the council sort of led us to believe. So we decided that we were going to get some stuff together in time for uh, 2026 and have a kind of um, centenary year at the golf club. Um, it's turned out actually that they were three years out and we've got another three years. It won't be till 2029 um, that we have a centenary. But basically, we've spent around about three years now um, researching as much as we can. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the pandemic's hit us, so we, we can't go into certain places where we want to get information from. Um, but at the moment, we have uh, around about a 65 page booklet and we're thinking it could go up to sort of 75, 80 pages by, by the time we've finished. So what I'm going to present to you tonight is kind of like a bit of a pre-seed version, I suppose. It's going to be the highlights of the history of Hayes Hill. Um, and what I've chosen to do is I've chosen to focus on the opening of the courses, um, some information on the opening of other local courses and the impact that Hayes Hill Golf Course had on local councils and the local areas surrounding uh, uh, Ryslip Northwood Urban District Council as it was in those days. Um, and then the major changes and events at Haystel. Uh, finally, the war years, um, because they're always of interest and plenty went on at Haystel during the war years and probably the biggest event in the history of, uh, of the course happened during those war years. Um, if I don't sort of give you the highlights, I fear we could be here till dawn if I went through all 63 pages. So we'll keep it to those highlights for you. OK, um, so first of all, Hill of Fury, a history of Hastel Golf Club. Now, I've gone back a little bit and I've looked at the uh, kind of uh, beginnings of, uh, of, of, of Hastel. Uh, and first of all, we sort of want to look at where the name came from. Now, looking back as far as I can go, um, it kind of was first of all called Hastel. H-A-S-T. But that name is believed to come from an, an evolution of the word uh, Heist Hill. Um, and, the, and that name uh, is apparently due to the fact that there would have been a heist or a fierce sanguinary battle or conflict that took place on Heist Hill. And that's believed to be related to West Saxon forces breaking into the area and fighting with Romano British armies. And that would have been sometimes around the sixth century. Um, there's other um, uh, kind of records of similar sort of battles taking place, one in the area of what is now RAF Northolk. So it's, it's very likely that that's where the name came from. And hence the name of the title of this history, because a modern kind of translation, if you like, of Hast Hill or Haste Hill or Heist Hill, depending on how you actually want to pronounce it, will be Hill of Violence or perhaps a slightly nicer name, Hill of Fury, which is the one that we decided would be better to go for. Um, so the story of how there came to be a golf course at Haste Hill really begins with the extension of the Metropolitan Railway from Harrow on the Hill to Rickmansworth, um, with Northwood Station opening on the 1st of September 1887. And with the advent of the railway, develop, development of the area began in earnest. In 1895, the Local Government Act brought about the formation of parish councils, and the Ryslip Parish Council were quite keen to avoid overdevelopment and they began transferring land into public ownership towards the end of the century. Uh, so I'm just going to move on a little bit. Yeah, I'm sorry the slides haven't come through yet, Adrian. They're not still... Well, that's OK. I'll, we, we, I'll bring yeah, them up okay. as soon as they do, but it might no be it's a rather no big problem. email, I'm guessing. Yeah, there's a few on there, yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, and then, of course, Ryslip Northwood Urban District Council came into being in 1904 to take over the work of the parish council. And they were actually tasked with developing the area in a kind of controlled manner. And in 1913, as you're probably aware, they became the first local authority to publish a town planning scheme. Um, although the plan is proposed to only set aside around 159 acres of land for recreational use. 
Now, recollections of people living in Northwood in the early years of the 20th century speak of a very narrow brick-built bridge that crossed Rickmansworth Road at the time. Um, and then you would walk through that and then pass up the hill. Uh, and on your left-hand side, you had New uh, Farm, which ran alongside the road. Now, like most of the local farms, New Farm was a dairy farm, and it was run by a Mr. Foxley. Uh, he, he, uh, uh, was, he ran a dairy farm, he had his cattle, and they kind of grazed the land almost down to the waters of Ricelip Reservoir, as it was in those days. He, he appears to have been the last farmer to farm New Farm um, and uh, uh, the land at Haste Hill. And he was also apparently a local tax collector, and he would travel around the area on a horse and cart collecting the taxes, which I think is a very romantic image for us all. <laughs> Um, basically, the council then bought the land off of the Hawtree Dean estate um, as it was as uh, that family were attempting to uh, have the land developed. So the, the, the council, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the council at the time uh, bought the land to stop sort of building going on there. But they decided that basically they didn't want to leave the land to lie fallow. So they needed to do something with the land. Now, meanwhile, uh, there was overt suggestions in the local press letters from readers in the local advertiser and gazette going from about 1924 onwards, suggesting that there was a growing desire in Northwood for the formation of an artisan golf club, something along the lines to what was called the Hollybush Golf Club at Chorley Wood in those days. The article went on to suggest the municipal, municipal enterprise was desirable and recommended that the land at Haste Hill and around Ricelip Common, such as Paul, Paul's Fields and the very words they used, if once the approval of the charity commissioners was obtained, could be cheaply made into a golf course without in any way restricting public rights. Then by 1927, thanks to the efforts of local councillors such as the recently elected T.R. Parker, the council were being held up as an example to London councils for taking the long view as they had secured the preservation of the magnificent stretch of open country all the way from northward to Ricelip and a little beyond. But more, and more importantly for this history, 60 acres have been recently acquired in the direction of Haste Hill for a further open space, which practically links up with the reservoir and Paws Field. So there is now to be a magnificent stretch of open country, hundreds of acres in extent, as well as a splendid view, which is going to be a permanent asset for the whole district. Now, having acquired most of that land, as I say, they didn't want it to leave leave the land lying fallow they purchased up another small parcel of land on the southwest corner of the plot which was still um, owned by king's college and they decided they were going to put down a sports field that comprised comprised the nine hole golf links uh, a putting course and a pavilion uh, with access through a gate from the driveway they also wanted a uh, proper sports field for uh, cricket football and uh, and hockey now, of course, this met with uh, quite a lot of opposition from the people who lived on the drive. There were only 18 houses on that road at the time. Uh, and it was quite, quite a cul-de-sac, as you can imagine. It was enclosed at the far end by a hedge. And around one third of the road was still unbuilt at that stage. The residents actually formed a committee challenging the decision. And uh, they were, they, they, in their view, it was the principal charm of the road, peace and quietude, as they called it, would be lost. The council were imposing costs of 90 to 600 pounds, depending on the width of the frontage of each property for the road to be upgraded. And as you can imagine, if you were asked to find 600 pounds for road repairs now, you'd be a little bit taken aback. In those days, 600 pounds was a heck of a lot of money. Um, now, the council themselves were actually proposing to contribute just 84 pounds towards the cost because of the width of the gate at the end of the road would be what their costs were based on the width of their frontage. So the issue actually went to court and magistrates found that the proposals of the council were, and I quote, most unreasonable. But they also said that they were not in a position to insist the apportionment of cost was altered. Now, it's not clear, if any, what uh, final resolution there was, although the roadworks clearly went ahead. So did the sports ground. And in, in, in later reporting would appear to indicate the council either reduced the charges to the residents or possibly even met the whole cost of the improvements themselves. Now, what we're hoping to do in the near future is, is get in um, to the Civic Centre there uh, and, and have a look and see what kind of information there is from council meeting minutes around that time, see if we can find any more on that. But at the moment, that, that's all we have on that subject. 
Now, the, the Ryslip Northwood Municipal Sports Ground, as it was known, opened at Haste Hill on Saturday, the 27th of July, 1929. And it was the first municipal golf course to be laid down in the county of Middlesex. Now, that's to say there were other public courses, i.e. courses that are open to the public, but actually owned by the council. It was the first of its kind in, in the county of Middlesex. Now, at that event, the chairman of Ryslip Northwood Council, Mr Mitchell, declared the sports ground completed a chain of open space extending from Northwood across Ryslip and East Coast. And then he hit a drive off the first tee to declare the 60-acre nine-hole course open. The previously mentioned T.R. Parker then hit a brassy, which is the equivalent of a two-wood today, which is your second biggest club in your bag. Mr. Parker was to donate a trophy in 1933 for the club to play for when he retired from the council, and the club still plays for that cup to this day. Um, Sir Charles Pinkham, the alderman and chairman of Middlesex County Council, who had contributed 25% to the costs of building the course, then struck a mashy. Now, that would be approximate to a modern pitching wedge, which is one of the smallest clubs in, the, in a golfer's bag. And the last shot was played by alderman Mr H Marlow Reid, who was the vice chairman of Middlesex County Council. We don't know what club he hit. That's not recorded. And we don't actually know how good any of those shots were. Now, the first full round of 18 holes, which have been twice around the course, that was played by Sandy Hurd, who was the Open champion of 1902. Um, he was the runner up at the Open on several more occasions and he was golf professional at Moor Park. But more importantly, he was the, the architect of the course itself. He designed it and oversaw the building of Haystill Golf Course. There's a lot of information out on most websites that indicate it's believed to have been built by Harry Colt, who's quite a famous golf course designer. And I can confirm from our research that that's definitely not the case. And I'll explain why later that's probably the, the belief that some people have. And it's probably quite a reasonable belief, but it is incorrect. Also on that first match was John Henry Taylor. Now he was another local resident and he was a huge supporter of public golf courses because he felt that the, the sport should not just be the preserve of those that could afford fees at the big private clubs, such as Northwood Golf Course that was next door. Taylor was the Open champion five times and he was Britain's winning rider cup captain in 1933. He was also a co-designer of Pinnahill Golf Course. The third member of that group was Robert Burt, or as he preferred, Bertie Pearson, and he was the first course professional at Haste Hill. He lived upstairs in the clubhouse that was then known as Golf House The Drive Northward, and he lived with his wife there. His duties extended to providing catering and waiting staff for the pavilion, and he also collected green fees from the golfers, and he also taught the game on the course. And the final member of that, comp, that, that match, that four ball match, was a Mr. H.R. Metcalf. Now, he was the council surveyor for the course, and he was the manager of the contractors that laid down the sports ground. You may not be surprised now that first match ended in what was possibly a diplomatic draw. Now, we did have a slide that actually had the, uh, um, the nine hole course on it for you to look at. Has, has anything come through? No, yet? no. Would you like to just check it, take a moment to check yeah, the email actually went, that it's not waiting to be spell checked or anything? Yeah, no, it's a bit strange, isn't it? Um, let's have a look. Uh, something else happened with that. Bear me a second, I'll just go back in a look because it's not showing on my phone has sent. So I'll just go back into the Let me just try that again because it does seem to have done something unusual.
Okay, hopefully that's going to come through this time. Okay, I'll bring it up the moment it arrives. Okay, no worries. All right, we can we can uh, go, to go back when you've got the slides up. We can. Um, yeah, we can go back go to that. Have a picture, look through. Yes. Yeah. Let me just. Okay. That's great. So we'll have a look at that slide in a minute. Um, now, basically, I, I, I'm not going to go into details on the holes because I could sit here and reel off all the details of each hole that would just bore us all senses, probably including me. So what I'll say is if you would like to know any more about those holes and the exact layout, the, the full details of those are actually on the club website, which is www.hastehillgolfclub.co.uk. And there's a couple of history pages on there that go into the full details. But the bogey, which is now called par, in those days we called it bogey. We blame the Americans for changing that word to par. Um, for the course was actually 38. So you needed 38, 38 shots to get round the nine hole. So a full round of golf, twice round the course, would have been 76 shots, which is actually quite a long course. Normally most courses would have been around about 72, 73 in those days. Now, there were actually barely any trees around the course at the time. It was very much parkland. Um, and uh, again, when we have a look at the slides, you'll see that there, there is literally barely a tree on there. Ah, oh, there we go. So we've got yes. this slide. So that, that was our introduction. Should we do this in a bit of a COVID kind of way? And next slide, please. OK, that, that is the that's the entrance to the drive. That's from a photograph in 1925. So you can see there that the actual the road was very unbuilt. You can see it's unmetalled at all there and it's it's very rough. Uh, can we move to the next one, please, Simon? Now, this was a press release at the time of uh, uh, the golf course opening. And you can see there it mentions the people that were actually there. And it congratulates them. Now, this, this, was, the, this was the actual original hand-drawn map that was given out to the press when the course was launched. So you can probably see there, if you're familiar with Haystill Golf Course, you can probably see there where, where the hole one is, and you may be able to recognise that's actually now the tenth hole, although it has actually reverted back to being the first hole at times. But you can probably also see from that that it doesn't go that full length, whereas the, the tenth hole nowadays goes right from the clubhouse right to the back of the course, because actually in those days that hole was split into two. So you had the first hole was 425 yards, and then it actually split into a pile three, which took you to the very back of the course. And there's been quite a lot. If you, there's quite a lot of interesting changes on there, such as the fifth hole at the very bottom of the screen there. That in those days, it was actually played in reverse. So you played uphill. Nowadays, that's been completely reversed and you play down the hill on what is now the eighth hole. And then the last real thing to note there is you're seeing that top corner where the playing fields were. That now is uh, uh, two to three holes of the course that those playing fields covered and at the very top there you'll just see it's very difficult to make out that little sort of uh, quadrilateral at the top there slightly diamond shape that actually says putting course and I'll, I'll talk about that again in just a minute now if we could just have the next slide Simon and that gives you an idea so what we've done there is we've stolen some of Google stuff which apparently they're happy for us to do and we've overlaid where those holes fit in over the current layout of the course so again if you're familiar with Haystill you can see there's some quite strange bits and pieces on there compared to how it looks today okay I'll, I'll move on and uh, get back to the uh, the script so in addition to the nine hole course the the putting course that we've shown there stretched across from a line just inside the current entrance gate um, and across the 13th tee boxes and the 12th green uh, and right over to the footpath by the side of Northwood Golf Club there. It would have been quite an impressive size I and mean, it would have likely to have had 18 holes on it just for putting. Um, and it probably reached down as far as the stockade fence, which is at the back of the car park now at the Haystill Golf Course. And as well as golf, there was that cricket pitch in the summer and that covered most of what is now the practice area alongside the 10th hole. Uh, and would have covered around about three of the holes, the 11th, 12th and 13th as they are now. And you can notice if you're ever up there that th that area is particularly flat as you walk in through that kind of front gate into the car park. The area to your right and in front of you is very flat. And that would have been where the cricket pitch was. And in the winter, I imagine the, the cricket square was kept safe. But other than that, the whole area was turned over to football and hockey. 
the pavilion, uh, as it was built originally, would have just been the centre section of the uh, of the pavilion without the wings on either end. And it was around about something like 75, 80 percent of the depth of the current pavilion. And if you're inside that clubhouse now, you can see some uh, pillars um, supporting the roof. That would have been the original front wall of the clubhouse before they added um, a veranda, which was then turned into part of the inside of the uh, of the clubhouse. Now, golfers could hire lockers uh, in the pavilion and make use of changing rooms, although these were actually primarily at that time changing rooms for the sport pitches. You could buy some light refreshments in there, um, but there was no alcohol served and no, no hot meals served inside the clubhouse at that time. The course was uh, pay and play, which means basically anybody could turn up um, and pay and just play um, without needing to be members and without needing to book sort of in advance. But they did also produce annual season tickets. They were available. And to give you an idea of the prices, the season ticket to play uh, for seven days, uh, any day of the week, was £3, 13, 13 shillings and sixpence, which is around the equivalent of £3.68 today. Um, and to compare that to today's prices, the last season ticket that the council actually released, which is a couple of years ago now, was £510 to play for seven days. And then 18 holes, which would have been twice around the course, that was priced at one shilling and sixpence, which is around about sort of eight or nine pence today. Um, and today, at the moment, they've just announced the figures for this year, and 18 holes will be £23.50 and pence in the coming summer. Now, the course even opened until 1936 on Christmas Day until 1 p.m. So you could even go for a round on Christmas morning before settling back and having lunch with the family afterwards. Uh, Robert Bertie Pearson, he offered lessons at the rate of four shillings, which would be something like 20 pence for one hour of instruction or two shillings and sixpence, which would be something like 13 pence for 30 minutes of instruction. Now, that first summer of 1929, uh, was extremely hot, much like the summer we had a couple of years ago. And the course was considered to be in very poor condition as a result of the drought. Irrigation at that time was provided by a 20-year-old Shand Mason steamer pump that was actually a recycled fire engine that was retired from service locally a little bit before the course opened. Uh, oh, we did have a slide up. I think we've jumped past that one. Haven't we? Oh, there it is. That's the one. Thank you, Simon. So that's the that's what a Shand Mason steamer pump fire engine at the time looked like. It would have been exactly one of those. And it would have been obviously a tank of water set on a steam engine. You took that round the course and wherever you needed the water, you delivered it from the tank on the top. Now, uh, by Monday, the 14th of October, of that year, 1929, 39 applications for season tickets had been made, and it was a slightly more formal process there. You were actually vetted by a group of council employees, but all 39 of those applicants were successful, I'm pleased to say. Now, that date is key to the history of Hastill Golf Club, as a meeting was held that evening to elect uh, officers to what were called the committee of season ticket holders at that time. They weren't actually known as a club. Now, the season ticket holders were asked to assist in the running of competitions, uh, selection of teams to represent the course and make recommendations to the golf management committee in relation to course improvements and maintenance. Uh, it was quite quickly suggested that the course should be extended uh, in view of lengthy wait times to play and the levels of congestion on Sundays with golfers having to play the nine hole track twice. They were getting caught up with each other. And also, uh, Harrow Golf Course, which was sited at Preston Road, was shortly to be closed to be turned over to housing. And they wanted, obviously, to gain as many of those people as possible. The sports ground faced some issues early on, though. In March 1930, there were proposals to turn the Hastel open space into a rubbish tip. Now, that would have been uh, actually pulling back the ground, putting rubbish into the ground, and then um, tipping soil back over the top of it. And there was all sorts of issues, as you can imagine, with that. People really did get in a bit of a tiz over it. Uh, and the, the local councillor, T.A. Kenyon, refuted those claims. Uh, he said that there was no uh, what they call controlled tipping plan for Haste Hill. And that the golf links, he declared the following, the golf links is self-supporting. And if possible, it would be turned into an 18-hole course. By May 1930, the extension appeared to be practically a done deal. 
The council decided that in view of the sporting teams being displaced, they were to purchase land along Chestnut Avenue to provide new facilities and a further eight and a half acres of land on Haste Hill to replace the public land that would be lost. And then uh, many consider the planning of the extra holes to be a sweetener. Um, they considered, oh, we'll extend the golf course and then we'll slip through the, uh, the tip proposals. And it did actually take right through until August for the, the tip proposals to be outright rejected by the council. Uh, if we can have the next silo, please, Simon. Now, that's Ale Alexander Sandy Hurd. Uh, he's the man who uh, was architect of the golf course. And in August 1930, he was made an honorary life member of Haste Hill Golf Course. The course was such a success that at one point, even a further access road was being considered, which would have likely either come from Chestnut Avenue, which was the most likely point. But there was also talk of bringing one in from Wiltshire Lane, um, which actually sort of extended slightly further into the woods at that time. By the start of the 1930-31 football season, two football clubs at least called Haste Hill Golf Club their home. They were Northwood United, which is now Northwood FC, and Oakland's Gate FC. Now, that's believed to be a team of council employees, as the offices at that time were in Oakland's Gate, which a lot of you will be aware is a road off Green Lane in Northwood. And they were entertaining sides such as Roxith United, Wembley Town, and Harrow Sheet Metal Workers. Um, and the ground was also home to Northwood Cricket Club in those days. Now, as a result of how well it was all going and the number of people using the course, the council had a meeting in January 1931 and a formal agreement was reached to extend Haystill Golf Course. The, the management committee recommended purchasing 12.6 acres of adjacent land on Haste Hill for £1,800. So, of course, as you can imagine, there was some opposition with that. And somewhat ironically, locals then said um, that the extension of the golf course is a punishment for people opposing the tip going ahead. So the council couldn't really win on that one either way. And after 18 months of being led by a, a four-man board, in April of that year, the committee of season ticket holders elected their first captain, Mr. E.G. Baker. And then later that year, the council decided to add lacrosse lacrosse to the games that were being played at the sports ground for the 1931-1932 season, which caused some of the golf members to think that the extension may not be going ahead. The, uh, the extension did go to the uh, Ministry of Health in July 1931. Uh, that they, their sort of uh, approval was required to change the use of the sport pitches for golf. But a month later, the Ministry sanctioned the construction of the additional holes. Northwood United then moved up to their site along Chestnut Avenue and they would turn out to be very happy because they said that that uh, pitch drained far better than the pitch at Haste Hill. And I can uh, agree with what they're saying because the area where the pitches would have been does get very, very damp in the winter and it would have been a horrible place to play football. But with football still being played at the sports ground, the committee was uh, pushing for this extension to go ahead and Harrow Golf Course at that time had closed. The council did report that not only had the required land been purchased, but the, the further land that they were purchasing for the displaced port sports teams that were using the facilities um, had actually been purchased as well. Hastel Golf Club actually played a charity composition in support of Northwood Cricket Club to assist with the purchase of their own ground, raising the princely sum of £3. Now, Northwood Cricket Club didn't move into their own ground straight after that, but they are now based, as many of you know, on Ducks Hill Road ground, um, which is opposite the Gate Public House. You can just see it on there on Rickmansworth Road. So the course extension work that began with Sandy Hurd, again the architect, this time with the assistance of Bertie Pearson and the constructor of golf courses from Glasgow, Mr. John R. Scott. And he was paid the princely sum of £945 to carry out the required works. In uh, early 1932, the first lady captain was uh, elected at Haste Hill. Miss Betty Preston Hillary was elected at the start of the season. Now, by May 1932, an article in the local papers reported the following. Assisted by showers, the new nine holes at Haste Hill Municipal Golf Course Northward are in excellent condition. And although no definite opening date has been fixed, it is expected that the full 18 hole course will be ready to, for play toward the end of June. Despite the limited acreage available, the old nine hole course, with the addition of the adjoining playing fields and a portion of Haste Hill, have been utilised in an ingenious manner 
to accommodate a full 18 holes. Sandy Heard, the Moor Park professional, assisted by Bert Pearson, professional of course, have been responsible for the layout of the extended course. Regular users will find many changes. So the 18 holes eventually opened on Wednesday the 20th of July 1932 at 6 p.m. And the bogey, now known as the par for the course, was set at 70. And the total outlay in the end was £8,360 for the extension. Now, it seems it was with a little less fanfare than the original course opening, although a huge crowd did gather to witness the first round of golf played again by two Open champions. Now, you can imagine today if someone like Porrig Harrington and Marco Mira, they would kind of be the contemporary um, kind of equivalents. If they turned out to play a round at Haste Hill, you could be sure there would be a little bit of a crowd. Now, if um, we can just move on to the next slide, please, Simon. Now, that's the layout of the 18 hole course as it was in those days. So, again, you can see some slight anomalies there where things are a little bit different. The big one that you will notice probably is over on the right hand side of the picture. Um, we now got the what is now the sixth hole goes straight down the hill and you can clearly see the layout of the hole. In those days, it was actually the 16th. And you can see that whilst the tee was in almost the same position, it cut straight across what is now the practice area, across the tee boxes for the fourth and seventh holes. And actually, you played to the third green as it is nowadays, uh, with the third actual hole being shorter when the course originally opened. Now, whilst they uh, uh, did the works on the golf course, that did actually mean that they had to reduce in size the putting course, but it was still quite considerable and entered, uh, filled an area um, that was considered large enough for a bowling green um, and would have taken up most of what is the car park these days. Now, if we can just have the next slide, please, Simon. Sorry. Now, that is the, that's it. Yeah, that's, that's a photo of the opening tee shot from the first match at the newly extended 18 hole course. So that tee box would have been what is now the 13th tee box. So as you, again, if you're walking in from the drive or driving in from the drive, it's the tee box just over on your right hand side to the right of the car park, just through the trees there. So you can see how there's barely a tree in that, in fact, there's no trees in that picture at all. Um, it's a really clear open sort of space there. Now that first tee shot was played by Mr. J.A. Hutt. He was a, a JP and chairman of Ryslip Northwood Council. The first match followed straight after. That was played between Sandy Hurd, who we know is the Open champion, but also by Ted Ray, who was the 1912 Open champion and the 1920 US Open champion. And, <coughs> excuse me. And he was the golf professional at Oxy. Percy Baxter, who was the golf professional at Northwood, joined them. And together with our course professional at the time, Bertie Pearson. Hastel Golf Course was so popular uh, following the extension that it was thought possible at one point there may be a reduction in the rates due to the income that was generated from green fees. And in view of this, in August 1933, Penny Parish Council proposed to Hendon Rural Council that Pinner Park be turned into a municipal golf course. But clearly that idea gained no traction. There was also an idea for a municipal golf course at South Harrow. But again, that did not go ahead. But with the success of Haste Hill, neighbouring Uxbridge Urban District Council decided to construct a golf course on land they had acquired for Greenbelt off Harville Road. The land had formed part of the deer park attached to the Harefield Place estate and had before that been a farm. And knowing of his work on the courses in the area, they asked Sandy Heard to design the layout. In 1934, Ryslip Northwood Urban District Council acquired the land upon which Ryslip Golf Course stood to prevent the owner, Mr. George Whedon, selling it to developers. In addition, they, per surround, they purchased even surrounding parcels of land in order to extend and improve the facility. Mr. Whedon had originally founded the course as the private concerned King's End Golf Links in October 1914. Before that, the site had been pleasure grounds that Mr. Whedon had set up on his King's End farm to explore the large number of day trippers visiting from the more urban areas of London. Now, you will note that the timing of that golf course opening in October 1914 was very close to the outbreak of the First World War. And um, the reason I mentioned that will become a little bit more apparent later on. Now, in view of the holes being laid out at Harefield Place and the completion of works at the recently acquired King's End Golf Course being still a long way off, 
The council have continued improvements at the course at Haste Hill. And in May 1935, they approved in principle the addition of another nine holes at Haste Hill, which were to be a pitch and putt, or in, or in other words, all the holes would be par three. Um, and that was going to be a relief course. It was to be built on land adjoining the existing layout to ease congestion and prevent any loss of revenue to the soon to open Uxbridge course. Now, subject to the exact position being agreed, £450 was set aside in March for that purpose. In March 1936, our club secretary, uh, Mr. A.S. Lowe, uh, was appointed to the executive committee of the, of the National Association of Public Golf Courses, known as the NAPGC. He held that position for quite a while, um, and it's probably no coincidence that Hastel Golf Course was affiliated to the NABGC later that year. And they were also got to join the England Golf Union at that time. So that made them quite a, a you know, a recognised golf course. Although they weren't a club, the course was being recognised as quite a serious golf course at that time. Now, if we could just have the next slide, please, Simon. Now, that gives you an idea of where the par three course is. Unfortunately, there's very little in the way of records whatsoever. We found nothing. The, the only real thing that we know about that course is that the first hole was 65 yards long and the second hole was 125 yards long. We do also know that it was a tight, tricky course, as Bert Pearson reported that lots of balls had been lost in the first round that was played on it. But you can see there, this is... Uh, th th this square runs right up to uh, Chestnut Avenue, or this uh, this shape runs right up to uh, to Chestnut Avenue, and you can see that white kind of building is now the Northwood Club, and then it ran right down through that sort of is now scrubland to the left of the first hole at Hayes Hill, round onto the sixth hole, up most of the sixth hole, and then across into that corner of land round by the cemetery there. Now we can find evidence. On the actual sixth hole, there's some very strange undulations in the ground, which are clearly kind of the location of tee boxes or greens for some of those par three holes. Now, we do hope to find out more again when we visit the council offices when we're able to do so. And we're just negotiating being able to access some of those council meeting minutes, which we think is the best thing in terms of actually finding more about it. Now, the very small, small square at the top on that slide um, that is the alternative position that we have for the possibility of where the house called the bungalow that was built in 1938 as a greenkeeper's lodge for haste hill uh, we don't we believe either pine lodge was built at that time and has since moved on to the uh, to be used by the cemetery although there's a lot of contradictory information that would indicate pine tree lodge was built just for the cemetery now that would indicate us possibly that the bungalow was elsewhere and the most likely position is there um, by the side of the course where the uh, Northwood Club is today. Although again, we'd like to get into some of those council records to see if we can find a little bit more out about it. Now, the earliest known aerial photograph of Haystill is from 1934. And if I can just ask Simon to fire across to the next slide. Now that's the one. Now I've zoomed in onto that because this was a photo taken from kind of above uh, the Northwood Hills roundabout there. Uh, um, it was actually sort of above Potter Street School as it was in those days. Um, and we've zoomed in there, but you can you can clearly see where the, the, the hole in the foreground here, the first one you can see goes down at a diagonal over to where that third hole is rather than coming directly down the hill. It does look, um, it's slightly misleading um, when you look at that photo. It looks like there's a very sharp rise in the hill but i think it's the way the photo has been taken that the hill doesn't rise as much right to left as that may suggest <coughs> excuse me now interestingly enough you can see how few trees there are there but the pair of trees in the background sort of center right they're actually still existence today um, and they are the the trees that kind of line the third tee box at haste hill to this day i'm just going to take a slurp of this tea because i've got a Bit of a frog in my throat. Okay. Now, Horace uh, Smith was the greenkeeper at Hayes Till, who would have moved into the uh, into the bungalow, and that was completed in 1938. And we can see that the 1939 register details Horace is living in a property along Chestnut Avenue, named the bungalow. 
Now we're going to move on and, and look at the war years, um, basically sort of 1938 through to 1945. By the middle of 1938, World War II was seen by many as almost inevitable and recruits to the recently created jobs of ARP, Air Raid Precautions Warden, first aiders and anti-gas helpers and decontamination squads were all trained in the Haste Hill Pavilion. Training took place up to five nights per week and the ARPs were also holding their regular meetings in the pavilion. An impressive total of 1,500 volunteers were recruited to the posts in the local area. And on at least one occasion, a home office van that had been converted into a mobile gas chamber was brought onto the site and the ARP wardens would have passed through the chamber as part of their training. And they were exposed to, amongst other gases, lewisite, mustard gas and chlorine gas. Now, the ARPs were instructed to practice wearing their gas masks as much as possible in everyday situations. So they were always prepared in the event of an air raid. Embracing this instruction to the full, they even scheduled an ARPs match for that July at Haste Hill, planning to play the full 18 holes in their gas masks. It raised quite a lot of local interest and a lot of people were going to come and attend and watch the match. But perhaps unfortunately, or perhaps wisely, the chairman of the Fire Brigade and ARP committee, Mr RJ Page, stepped in to forbid the comp competition going ahead. He considered, and his words were, it is not considered advisable. Now, after an association going back to almost the inception of the course at Haste Hill, including two years as club secretary, two as captain, and holding a place on the NAPGC committee, A.S. Lowe left Haste Hill. He became the captain of the newly formed Rickmansworth Golf Club. And the club was based at Rickmansworth Municipal Golf Course that came into being when Rickmansworth Urban Council purchased Moore Park Mansion and the surrounding acres from the Moore Park Estate in 1937. A little bit of a theme here, they purchased the land to prevent further house building. Um, now, that was the home to three golf courses, the East Course, the West Course and the High Course. And the, the, the sites had been leased out to Moore Park Golf Club. Well, sorry, the, the courses were then leased back out to Moore Park Golf Club after the purchase, except for the East Course that became Rickmansworth. Before the sale, it was known as the Ladies Course, and it is now affectionately labelled Tricky Ricky. <laughs> the course had quite an opening with Sandy Hurd joining Bill Laidlaw from Scotland, for a Scotland versus England match against Ernie Whitcomb and again John Henry Taylor put, took part. Now, interestingly enough, it was Harry Colt uh, who actually designed the courses at Moore Park. And um, sometimes the Moore Park courses were already being called Rickmansworth and even Northward. And we believe that that's the reason why people may be confused and thinking that Harry Colt designed the course at Hastill. By September, Hastill Clubhouse had been set up to act as a casualty clearing station or a temporary hospital in the event of air raids, with alterations made to the living quarters of the club professional Bertie Pearson and his wife. As hostilities grew ever more inevitable, and in January, sorry, in January 1939, Bertie Pearson was himself inducted as an ARP, a role he performed throughout the war. And then February saw past club captain MG Reynolds elected to the committee of the National Association of Public Golf Courses. So even in those days, for quite a small club um, on a public course, um, Hastel Golf Club was sort of quite well considered and, and punching a little bit above its weight. Now, further large additions and alterations at Hastel become less likely, not just due to the likelihood of conflict, but also on Saturday, the 2nd of September, 1939, the council opened the reconstructed Ricelip Golf Course. Now, you'll probably remember what I said about 1914. And of course, Britain went to declare war on Germany the very next day after Ricelip opened, Sunday, the 3rd of September. So just to warn you that Ricelip's closed at the moment, which I'll mention later on. Um, I'll give you all a warning when Ricelip's reopening because you never know what might happen that year. Uh, the Ricelip course was again designed by Sandy Hurd and the former King's End farmhouse, which stood almost opposite the White Bear public house, continued in use as the pavilion. The previous owner, Mr. George Whedon, had stayed on to manage the course on behalf of the council whilst the alterations were completed. The following March, on the, on the renewal of season tickets, the council gave the holders the option of playing both Haste Hill and the newly completed Ricelip course 
for an additional fee of 10 shillings and sixpence, something like 53 to 55 pence today. Uxbridge Urban District Council had completed 10 holes at their Harefield Place course when that course opened on Saturday, the 11th of May, 1940. It's not clear whether 10 holes were in use. It's more likely that they just ran nine, but the 10th one was ready for use. Seemingly popular as a course architect, Sandy Hurd had once again been asked to submit a design for that course, but it's not quite clear whether that was ever the one that was used. It is known that a Colonel Hotchkiss, assisted by course manager and professional Percy Woods, managed most of the work. But um, we're, again, we're not clear who the actual designers were. The Middlesex Agricultural War Committee, the MAWC, had insisted the course should be ploughed over, but the council successfully argued the facility would be a boost to morale and were only made to hand over the land set aside for the eight holes that were remain to be built. So you can see why they probably opened it in a little bit of a hurry there to make sure that it wasn't just ploughed over for food. In April 1941, the MAWC again sought to enforce the cultivation of Land Orders 1939, and the council were instructed to allow local farmers to graze their sheep on the Hastel Golf Course. They invited those in the area to apply for the appropriate rights. However, the course was open and farmers decided it was not viable to do so as they should have to employ shepherds to keep an eye on their animals. The council were very concerned and the committee were thinking that the, uh, uh, the Agricultural War Committee may extend the offer to herds of cattle. Now, this would, of course, meant far greater damage and would have necessitated the complete closure of the course, the course until such time as the act was rescinded. And in view of that, the council decided to purchase their own, purchase their own 150 sheep to keep on the course. They saw the decision as cost neutral as they felt they could bring the sheep onto the course, feed the sheep for the, uh, for the season, and at the end of the season, sell them off for the profit and then purchase more sheep for the following season. Now, another thing we are dying to find out is whether this ever went ahead, because that's unreported in anywhere that we can find. Now, you may have thought that Hayes Hill was a slightly remote area, um, being up on the hill there and kind of clearly just a sort of wooded area, but it did see quite a few of the air raids during the war, and there are records of 24 bombs being dropped in the close vicinity of the golf course. Now, if I could just have the... The next slide, please, uh, Simon. Now, between October, 9th, October the 7th, uh, 1940, and the 6th of June, 1941, the bomb sensor states that to the north and east of the course, two bombs were dropped in the vicinity of the drive, two close to Pinner Road, one near to Rippensworth Road, and one near to Chestnut Avenue. To the south, the three are recorded as landing near Wiltshire Lane, and one on the edge of the white tee box of the now fifth hole. And you can see there where the golf course is just cut off there in the top of that picture. And you can see the bomb that would have probably landed. Um, nowadays, that would be the kind of seventh green or the eighth tee box. And there's a cluster of bombs there on the 9th of May 41. And another couple of bombs over there by Wiltshire Lane on the 1st of October. Now, Along the western side, another one was dropped around Ricelip Lido, officially recorded as near to Reservoir Road, whilst the first 11 are recorded as landing around Ducks Hill Road. Looking a little further afield to include, if you include the whole of Northwood, Northwood Hills, Ricelip, Harefield, Pinner and Hatch End, the number of bombs recorded increases very dramatically. In July 1941, it was clear more of a sacrifice would be required of Haste Hill. And again, under the cultivation of lands orders, applications were invited for the ploughing of 36 acres of land that was Haste Hill Golf Course. Again, it's not recorded this one ahead, but given the acreage stated, it seems quite likely it spelt the end of the nine hole pitch and putt course, which wasn't quite performing as well as the council had hoped and wasn't really easing much of the congestion on the main course. Uh, if I could have the, the next slide, please, Simon. Uh, this is a kind of tragic moment in the history of Hayesdale. For me, it's one of the uh, uh, both the most tragic and one of the most interesting stories that we've got. On Sunday, the 20th of July, 1941, uh, we, we've got him as 30 years old, but as you can see there on the Commonwealth War Grave Certificate, they had him down aged at 31. 
Eric Semister or Simister of 34 Vaughan Road Harrow was killed when he was hit by the undercarriage of a plane. A later military record, which was entitled number 306, City of Torun Polish Squadron, RAF Northolt, stated the following. At that time, the base commander was receiving rather serious complaints from the local golf club. Players were complaining that too many flights by the Polish wing were being flown directly over their golf course and that it became quite a nuisance to them. This was intensely contested amongst the base personnel, with many pilots simply outraged by the fact that they cared more about a game of golf than the people who defended their country. And by the same token, someone's freedom to play the bloody game. Although being on leave, pilot officer Leon Hubert Jausch took the squadron's Tiger Moth number T7301 belonging to the base headquarters for a joyride. Probably stirred on by this recent controversy, he wanted to teach some players a lesson who were playing an evening round of golf. He made several passes at a couple of the players, with one of them refusing to lay flat every time the Tiger Moth wing flung just above their heads. Every pass, Leon Jausch flew a little bit lower and the player stood straight and proud. Eventually, he flew too low and literally decapitated a prominent figure of the local community. The pilot was jailed and never flew again for the RAF, whilst every effort was made to hush up the incident. Now, interestingly, when you look in the local press and uh, what you can find out about the, uh, uh, the inquest, things are slightly different. Uh, with Polish airmen facing prejudice when they first arrived in the UK, having fled their homeland following the Nazi invasion, such an incident would have done little to help the situation. And it appears efforts at suppression were broadly successful, with Flight Lieutenant W.G. New stating to the later inquest that Jausch had been instructed to give a young air cadet from Watford his first experience of a trip in a Tiger Moth biplane, although flying low was contrary to general orders. Performing loops, stall turns and low dives over the course, the pilot claimed to have misjudged the distance to the ground and stated that he usually flew aircraft with retractable undercarriages. He has further stated that although he knew such manoeuvres were forbidden, he wanted to, and I quote, give the lad a bit of experience. The inquest heard that many golfers and locals out walking had to jump out of the way of the oncoming aircraft with Eric, resident of West, sorry, we sorry, got him as West Avenue Rainers Lane. That's now been corrected to Vaughan Road, West Harrow. Um, a little slower to react than the rest. Witnesses did confirm there were two people aboard the plane, stated it had been flying around for a couple of hours, but perhaps surprisingly, none of the witnesses mentioned that Eric's head had been taken clean off. So did that happen? We're not quite sure. The inquest returned a verdict of accidental death and clearly not jailed for long, if at all, Jausch later served with the Air Transport Auxiliary, which was disbanded in 1947. Married to a British woman, Jausch later settled in the USA, where he became a citizen, and he passed away on the 8th of April 1984. He's buried in Los Alamitos, California. Now, if we can move on to a more cheery slide. Unfortunately, it's not. It's the obituary for Sandy Heard. And Alexander Sandy Heard passed away on the 18th of February 1944. Still living locally at the time, but having retained his broad Fife accent, Sandy had developed pneumonia following an operation at the age of 75. He was born in St Andrews, Scotland on the 24th of April 1868. And the Open Championship was the only major golf tournament he ever entered. Winning in 1902, 1902 at Highlake, he had also finished runner-up on four other occasions and in the top 10, a total of 20 times. That 1902 championship had a very dramatic finish with Heard taking a three shot lead into the final round, but carding an 81 over the last 18 holes. Harry Varden and James Braid both missed medium length putts at the final hole that would have forced a playoff and Heard took the championship. And he was the first champion to have ever won using what was known as the Haskell Robber Cord Golf Ball. His open appearances spanned a hugely impressive period of 50 years and in 1920 he became the oldest runner-up at the age of 52, a record which stood for 18, sorry, 89 years until Tom, Tom Watson's second place finish in 2009, so that did last a long time. He last made the cut in 1927, which means he qualified for the final two rounds and his final appearance at the finals was in 1933 
He competed right up until 1939, when at the age of 71, he failed to make it past the qualifying stage. His brothers, Frederick and David, were also both professionals. David was appointed the professional at the now long forgotten Wembley Golf Club that was officially opened right near Wembley Park Station uh, in the first half of 1896. And his brother Frederick, meanwhile, emigrated and was posted at the, as the professional at the Washington Park course in Chicago. Uh, more details of Sandy's life are again available on the club's website, where the obituary is a little bit more readable. And there's a little bit more information about his brother Frederick, um, who had to pay a deposit when he collected um, one of his uh, trophies, as uh, he was a little bit of a drinker and they thought he might pawn the trophy to buy some booze. <laughs> um, a hastily team triumphed nine and a half, eight and a half in a match in 1944, played against a team representing 13 battalion of the Home Guard. Despite the Home Guard having been on night exercises the very night before the match, they clearly gave a very solid account of themselves. And I'll just have to scroll down a little bit. Bear with me. If we can move on to the next slide, please, Simon. That's uh, an aerial photo of the course from 1945. And that year, after 16 years at Hastel, Bertie Pearson retired from his role as course professional and manager once the war had ended. It does make you wonder whether the war had had a little bit of an impact on him or maybe even the passing the previous year of his good friend Sandy Hurd. Um, but his efforts were key to the success of the course, notably assisting in the design of the extended course and the nine hole pitch and putt course. He and his wife were extremely popular amongst the members. They presented with a presented him with a check to show their gratitude. Bert was succeeded by a uh, strangely named, in my opinion, Mr. John Doe from Bournemouth. That was his real name. Uh, it was also to donate a cup to the club, which he still paid for, played for to this day. The council advertised the position of professional at Haystill right across the country with adverts known to have appeared in Aberdeen, Yorkshire and right down to the south coast. The position paid a salary of two shillings, sorry, two pounds, two shillings per week and also a one pound, one shilling per week war increment plus emoluments. I'll now move on to the, uh, just to have a quick look at that sort of aerial photograph. You can see there the kind of layout of the course is starting to look very familiar. Um, but over on this right hand side, you can see um, just where the kind of the diagonal line of that, what is now the sixth hole is still in place. And where that green is just um, below the parcel sort of three course, you can just see where the shorter path, the shorter hole is on the par four 13th hole which is now the third and been extended and if you look beyond that bit where uh just off the course there where i said the, the par three is you can see that that's actually quite clear there and there's evidence of kind of some bunkers and possibly some squared off areas uh, and indeed up on that sixth hole that are probably some of the tee boxes and bunkers and, and bits and pieces for the course but of course by that stage it's not quite clear because that would have been ploughed at that time and that would have probably gone on right until around about 1953 before the agricultural war commission handed back all the land that they'd taken for to provide food so we now move on to sort of um more recent history at Hayes Hill, which is kind of the shortest section and part of that is due to sort of world war ii really from the start of the war news of more traditional suits uh, pursuits seemingly uh, became a bit less of a draw and reporting in local newspapers um, of scores and events and things like that seemed to drop off and that trend continued once uh, peace had returned um, well what we do know is a new clubhouse opened at Ryslip and that was in March 1951 that was positioned in the area of what was the ninth green by the time the course closed in 2019 and at that point King's End farmhouse that had been used as the pavilion ever since 1941 was demolished to make way for housing and if we just flick on one more slide please simon now that's an aerial photo from 1952 uh, and that probably gives the sort of clearest photo that we've had to date and again you can see by this time the food seems to have gone the the the, the crop seems to have been removed you can very clearly see that diagonal layout of that hole and you can see at this time then, 
that right hand area was pretty much just an open space what is now the sixth hole but again you can see kind of remnants in that area behind uh, the drive uh, between that and chestnut avenue there where something's going on uh, you can see the line of the brook but it's not very clear to make out and again we hope to get some more information there The 1952 image also appears to bring to an end any sort of lingering romantic thoughts that Harry Colt could have been involved in remodeling at Hayes Hill. Because we can see from that that by 1952, the course was in its original, pretty much its original 18 hole layout um, and hadn't changed. But we know then the final changes to the course were made between 1952 and 1931. Harry Colt couldn't have been involved because unfortunately he passed away in November 1951. So the, court, the, the final changes to the course were made after his death. The 1952 saw the Middlesex Development Plan put in place and that protected open spaces such as Hayes Hill, as well as numerous other open spaces in the district from future development. But the turbulent beginnings for Uxbridge course had continued long after the war had ended with the Middlesex Agricultural Committee still refusing to return the land that had been appropriated for food production. Now, whether that land was then given back to what was by that time the municipal borough of Uxbridge or they had procured additional land uh, is unclear. Uh, but Harefield Place finally became an 18 hole golf course in 1957. In 1960, Horace Smith retired. He was the chap who was living in the bungalow at Greenkeeper's Lodge. He retired from his role at head greenkeeper at Hayes Hill. And he'd done a hugely impressive 31 years at Hayes Hill Golf Course by that time. He was presented with a check on behalf of the club members upon his retirement. And he was one of the very early to people to bring an external honour to Hayes Hill Golf Club. He won the annual Coming of Age Cup in 1952, played in Dublin that year. He shot rounds of 75, 72 and 69 net to win the Association of Greenkeepers Tournament for golfers over the age of 60. So he was a he was a healthy man playing golf at that time. In 1965, the club received and began to play a stable for competition, which is played to this day for the John G.T. Doe Trophy. Uh, and that was donated by his family as sadly John Doe passed away at that time after 19 years at the club. So you can see these, these early people who were working at Hastel Golf Club really did go there for a career and saw out their lives with the link, link, links to the golf club. Now, on perhaps what I consider the rather unfortunately chosen date of the 1st of April 1965, the London Borough of Hillingdon was formed by the merger of four district councils. And this brought Harefield Place or Uxbridge, Ryslip and Haste Hill Golf Courses under the same umbrella for the first time. By 1971, it is known from aerial photographs that Haste Hill Golf Course had evolved to the current layout. And it's, we are still trying to ascertain exactly what point between those dates the final alterations were made and who was the architect for those adjustments on the six holes that changed in that period. In the early 1970s, the council undertook a programme that saw literally thousands of trees planted on and around the course at Haste Hill, with the open lynx-like feel of the course slowly evolving to the more woodland setting we know today clearly well ahead of their time by doing that there is actually now another plan um, coming in the near future for another 1,000 trees to be planted on and around Haste Hill so they're clearly doing their bit for the environment and keeping those open spaces of interest for us all if I could have the next slide please Simon that's just a couple of images of the course taken recently. Uh, golf grew hugely in popularity in the latter half of the 20th century. In 1989, a record 200,000 rounds of golf were played across Hayes Hill, Ryslip and Uxbridge golf courses. The following January, golfers were actually sleeping in their cars to ensure they could secure a tee slot. And the council were turning away 300 to 400 bookings every weekend across the three courses. In an attempt to stop this practice of people sleeping in their cars, the council actually refused to start taking bookings around until 5 p.m. in the evening um, so that th these people just would not be out there. And there are actually members at the golf course now who will tell you tales of arriving at sort of two or three in the morning and sleeping in their car to be 
early in the queue to get the remaining sort of tea times available, which just seems absolutely crazy now in the times of online booking and everything like that. Golf course management were successfully tendering for the running of the Hillingdon's three golf courses in 1993. They spent a grand amount of £115,000 on machinery and took an extra 10 staff and spent £50,000 on improving the clubhouses. And in April, they had a public meeting at Hastill Golf Course for the company to put forward their vision for golfing Hillingdon. It did not go well. Um, being described as raucous with players shouting and complaining and heckling uh, due to the inflexible booking arrangements, higher prices and the removal of season tickets for the first time since the course had opened. Club members felt they were being pushed off the courses and they actually picketed the, the, the uh, pavilion at Hayes Hill in the car park. And they effectively closed the course for a whole weekend. The golf course company uh, dropped the weekend season tickets. Um, opting for a scheme allowing players to play three days a week, but not weekends when pay and play was the only option. Um, following the picket, a 282 signature petition, they relented and offered a card for Hillingdon residents only, giving players the chance to play one weekend round and one midweek round for £499 a year. Now, to give you a bit of kind of um, compare, 2018, uh, the price was £510 that the council were asking for unlimited golf seven days a week. So you can see sort of how much that was. Uh, with further arguments from the members, they uh, did actually reduce the price to £457.75. But the order of the playing of the holes was changed, um, uh, which has been sort of changed several times over the years. We've kind of switched from the first hole being the first as it is now and the 10th hole being the first, and at times we've also had the 13th hole being the first hole. If we could just have the next slide, please, Simon. Golf course management went into liquidation in December 2006, and the running of the three Hillenden golf courses were taken back in-house for just under two years before being put out to tender again. Mac Golf Hillenden became the new course managers for Hastill, Ricelip and Uxbridge on a very long 45-year lease in September 2008. But less than a year later, there were major disagreements over the groundworks at Uxbridge Golf Course. Following the installation of a gas pipeline from Harefield to Southall through part of the course at Uxbridge, National Grid agreed a figure to cover reinstatement works on the five affected holes. It involved three planning applications to alter the course, two appeals to the Secretary of State, and the saga finally came to an end in December 2011 with Matt Golf having withheld £300,000 worth of rent and leaving the council with a huge cost to bring the holes back to a playable standard. And it was all because Matt Golf wanted to take literally a couple of hundred thousand tonnes of uh, uh, landfill onto the course to raise it, whereas the original deal from the council was some, a much more manageable amount of landfill that could be taken onto the course. Um, and they literally argued that and spent all the money that they had to reinstate the holes on planning applications and appeals. So the council terminated their lease and took back control of all the three horse, the three courses once again. But sadly, Arxbridge remains a 13 hole layout to this day. Those holes have never been reinstated. And as it stands, only 12 of the holes are actually in use. It really uh, has been a kind of uh, turbulent time for Uxbridge Golf Course over the years. Now, the, the parent company of Mac Golf, Mac Trading, collapsed in October 2018, and they took down seven golf courses across the country in the process. But I'm pleased to say a number of those have since reopened under new management. A lot of them, like Hayes Hill, were actually partly only golf courses that they were brought in to manage. Moving on to 2018, the clubhouse was left without catering or bar facilities when contractors decided not to renew their contract. This significantly hit the membership numbers at the club, with many, many members deciding to move to other clubs with better facilities. Just this week, the council, I'm pleased to say, have announced a new catering contract has finally been awarded, although it will be many weeks before the clubhouse, bar and kitchen are open once again. 2019 saw Ricelip Golf Course closed um, for a planned period of five years for the high-speed rail at line HS2 to be constructed. Once the course reopens, it is not clear what sort of course 
and facilities there will be, as the remaining land will likely not be large enough for a full 18-hole course. Although, although the number of people playing golf is showing signs of beginning to rise again, um, it dropped significantly in the early part of this century. And we are still at a, a time where the numbers of people participating in outdoor sports and pastimes is currently at a kind of low point historically. In view of that, together with the number of challenges for the club to overcome recently, and with many people finding themselves lacking free time enough to run the clubs or societies, uh, we are fortunate at Hayes Hill to have a very committed group to keep it running. Now, the council have just recently put out a questionnaire to consult the public on the way forward with the three golf course sites. And we're kind of hoping that they're going to reinstate those five poles at Uxbridge. Um, kind of do something with Ryslip, maybe a nine hole course with some practice areas and a driving range. And we hope that Hayster will continue as it is, preferably with some kind of more practice facilities built onto the course. So there has been a lot of history on these few acres of land at Hayes Hill. So many professional golf courses, uh, golf golfers even, council officials and their colleagues, club members and casual players have all ensured that Hayes Hill Golf Course and Hayes Hill Golf Club have reached their 90th anniversaries. And we look, very much look forward to celebrating our centenary in a few years' time on what we think is an absolutely wonderful track of land and one of the most picturesque golf courses in the county. So should anyone like to delve any further into the history of Hayes Hill, please do visit the uh, haysthillgolfclub.co.uk website and visit those history pages. Uh, and if you've enjoyed this talk, uh, do let Simon know. I would be more than happy to come back and fill in some of the sort of areas that we haven't been able to cover tonight. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Hayes Hill, um, we are, a, as I say, a private club. We play on a council-owned course at Hayes Hill. Uh, we do have a thriving men's and ladies section with full programs of club competitions, inter-club matches, national and even international tournaments throughout the year. The membership fees for this coming year are just £60, which includes membership of Middlesex Golf, England Golf and the National Association of Public Golf Courses and as even includes golfers' liability insurance. The membership, though, does not include the green fees as they are managed separately by the council. But to give you an idea, green fees at peak times for the coming year have been set at just £23.50. So that will be a midsummer Saturday morning round of golf for just £23.50. There are small fees to take part in competitions at Hayes Hill, but they're literally three to four pounds per head. And they're used solely to fund the prizes and competition costs. So for what is a relatively small club, We've been very successful over the years, winning numerous county and national competitions. And we even qualified to represent England golf in Portugal a couple of years ago by winning the England Golf Sixes tournament. We sent our uh, one of our board members and one of our lady board members represented us in Portugal for that competition. Now, we have also won numerous national uh, and inter uh, sorry, new numerous uh, international, sorry, national competitions for both teams and individual events so if you're considering taking up golf maybe you're looking to return to the game following a hiatus or perhaps you're weary of huge fees and a lot of the politics i keep hearing about at the privately owned courses you would go a long way to find a better place to play golf than Hayes hill let me tell you so should you like to know more i can be contacted at communications at hayeshillgolfclub.co.uk or again you can visit the website where more information is available so thank you very much for listening to me this evening. I hope you find or you feel it has been time well spent and you've enjoyed my talk. Thank you very much indeed, Adrian. Absolutely fascinating. And uh, so much there that um, uh, fits in with the general history of uh, Northwood as we know it. And indeed, uh, you've covered Ryslip and Uxbridge as well. So um, it's a very, very useful talk. I'm surprised you hadn't commented on the apposite name of the approach road to um, Hastil Golf Club called yes, The Drive. Yeah. It, what a yes. brilliant name for, for the road. Pure irony. It's pure yes. irony. It was there before the... Exactly. Uh, the it predates open. the golf but club. Strange but... enough, it's, just, it's the same at Uxbridge, but I don't know if the name of that road, which is also The Drive, I don't know if that predates the golf course or not there, but it has actually the same name. So interesting, yes. 
Right. Well, um, Joan has put her hand up. Um, so I'll ask her first if she's got a question to put to you. Yes. And any, if anyone else has, uh, let's carry on for a few more minutes and see if there yes, are uh, points, yeah. points that perhaps you can answer. So over to you, Joan. Uh, do you have a junior section to bring forward new members or, or are you just um, adults? At the moment, we're, we're only inviting juniors that can play with um, a parent or grandparent um, rather than actually having a proper junior section. The reason is um, golf courses and golf clubs have just been um, asked to sort of undertake what's known as a safe golf charter. Um, Haste Hill have actually uh, kind of reached that accreditation, but we don't actually have the people in place to run a proper junior section. For those that are interested in junior golf, we actually recommend Brent Valley Golf Course, which is down in Hanwell. Uh, they have just got a grant and have an absolutely superb setup for junior golfers. They've literally just relaunched the section. So it's a great place and they do have the appropriate uh, people in place to run a junior section in accordance with the safe golf mark. So sorry, unfortunately, at the moment we can't entertain junior golfers, but Brent Valley Golf Club is a very welcoming club. We play there quite a lot in competition and they have a very good setup. Thank, thank okay. you very much, Adrian. Any more questions for Adrian from anyone? Either just unmute yourself and talk. Yes, I can see someone putting their hand up. Just unmute yourself and talk. Or put something in the chat window if you prefer. Press the space bar. Y yes, that's one way of unmuting is to press the space bar. <laughs> right, it's done now. Yep. yep, okay, yes, good. Um, I'm just going to say, I, I'm very interested in this because I really, I've really i been there, to we say, looking out at Haste Hill very often from the Rice Lido Railway, mm -hmm. going along the bottom. And, uh, you know, we occasionally see, you know, I, I look out of Bort's Horse Field when I'm working in um, the ticket office. I, I, and I hadn't really looked at the, I haven't never seen the start of the golf course at all. Right. It's okay. Well, thank it's you well for that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you for that. <laughs> a any, any more questions or thoughts from anyone? Right. OK, well, I think in that case, it remains for me to um, thank Adrian again for a fascinating talk. And I'm sure that the, the business of the person killed by the aeroplane, I mean, that's amazing. But that's really? not more yeah. well known uh, uh, that, that that happened. And surely the only occasion ever that someone on the ground was killed by an aeroplane other than um, due to a crash, I would have thought. Um, yes, has anyone yeah, ever, ever? Yes, yes, uh, possibly by accidents at airfields and airports themselves, but not uh, somewhere distant from where the, the aircraft is based. So thank you again for that. And I hope you can all join us again um, for the next meeting of the Rice Lip Northwood and Eastcote Local History Society on the 21st of February. That's another Monday when we are joined by Alexis uh, Haslam for, for the Fulham Palace Trust. We'll be talking about the restoration of the uh, of Fulham Palace, the former home of the uh, Bishops of London, of course. Um, and uh, that will be on Zoom again on the very same link that you've been on this evening. We hope possibly in March to resume meeting in person, but it, uh, watch this space. We'll uh, carry on with Zoom until further notice. So I uh, hope you've enjoyed this evening. I certainly have. And um, hope you can join us again on the third Monday in February, which is the 21st, for a talk about uh, Fulham Palace. And um, yes, uh, as Suzanne said uh, thanks to Adrian, very interesting talk. Thought the trees were much older and she loves the course. So that, that's a very kind comment. So nice to see you. you all. See you all again in February. Uh, enjoy, in, enjoy the, uh, <laughs> the seasonal weather and uh, see you in February. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>